And uh, so they didn't really know when that was happening, and that just happened just recently. So that's why there was kind of a surprise uh, dinner today, but, but how many can eat? Two of you? Okay, there, then there's plenty of food here. All right. All right, well, we're going to go to the Word of God today, and we're going to, you know, uh, dear Lisa, is Jeremy going to be over there? Oh, there he is. I'm sorry, brother. I didn't even see you. You're behind Roger there. All right. We're, we're obviously are going to bring them up and just pray with them. and uh, That would obviously be the right thing to do. So we're going to do that uh, during, during the worship time. However, the Lord wants to do that. That's what we're going to do. And uh, I know that there are needs here today. I want to encourage you that God works at the altar. Amen. And uh, I know some of you are ailing today, but God can bring healing today. And our sister has no oxygen today. Raise your hand right there. She has no oxygen today. Amen. So that's awesome. That's awesome. God is the healer. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you say this with me? Managing the fire. Managing the fire. It's amazing uh, what a person can put together if they will just listen to what the Spirit is trying to get across. All right, and uh, so let's just pray. Father, we thank you for the word today. We thank you for what is going to be shared. Father, we need your fire, Lord. We need it in this country. We need it in this uh, a town, Father. We need it in our families, Father. We need it in our lives. For the first time, perhaps, somebody is going to be hearing about the fire, about this very, what they would consider to be very mystical part of the book of Acts. But God, it's not mystical at all. It's not abstract. It's just, it's just so real. And, uh, Father, you want to do it once again. And we want to thank you for it. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Uh, there, uh, again, just to reiterate, there's only really two, two areas that all four Gospels uh, um, uh, bring in. One of them is the Holy Spirit, and the other one was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So all four of them thought to be rather important about wind and fire, about you know that we find in the book of Acts. But I want to start with Matthew chapter three, verse eleven. I want to welcome everyone that is online here with us uh, today. God bless you as well. But uh, indeed, I baptize you with water and what or, uh, unto repentance, excuse me. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. Now, we extensively, extensively covered this probably about almost four weeks ago now. So if you want that message, go back to it. But, but John adds something a little bit more than the other Gospels do. And he says, but he, everybody say he, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Amen. Everybody say fire. Amen. We, we did have a few people a couple weeks ago that were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let's give the Lord a hand there. Amen. Uh, they, they are probably going to soon testify about this if, when, when they get the, you know, I told them that God gave you the power of the witness. You might as well witness about the fact that God filled the Spirit. Right? Okay. So He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay. Now we're going to go into Acts chapter 2. We're going to start with verse 1. Okay, and, and in that verse it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, we were in this two weeks ago before Father's Day, how many enjoyed the message that the Holy Spirit gave on wind? I know a lot of people are saying, man, that was uh, uh, some revelation that they had never heard before. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. Everybody say that. Rushing mighty wind. Okay, and the Bible says that it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Okay, and then it goes on to say this. Then there appeared, everybody say appeared. There appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. Okay, and one sat upon each of them. So this was something, what we can perceive today as something that was visible. Would you agree with that? It wasn't just a feeling. It wasn't just a sense. It was something that was visible because it sat upon each of them. And when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says they began to speak with other tongues 
as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay? I know I've shared this before, but for you maybe that don't know this, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, would have been in this meeting because the Bible says so. And what's interesting about this is that Mary, being the mother of Jesus, is the only mother in the world that has ever felt uh, her son inside her twice. And the reason why I want to bring that up is because the Holy Spirit, though it's more than a feeling, we understand that, we also know that there's a sense that and a feeling when the Holy Spirit fills us. Amen? Just like Mary. Because I want to have this conversation with Mary when I get up. What did you say when the Holy Spirit came? And you probably turned to one of your friends and said, that's my boy. Amen? Come on, say it. That's my boy. It's not your boy, but it's her boy. Okay? Right? So I, I, I want you to think about this because it's very important. Because many look at this passage like I prayed at the beginning. They look at it as kind of mystical they look at it as kind of abstract, okay? You got the tongue thing, you got the wind thing, you got the fire thing. You get, it's kind of kind of gets complicated according to people. Um, they kind of think it's a strange, strange picture. And, and, and the reason why that is, generally speaking, even in Pentecost today, I don't think we have the context of what God was trying to accomplish with the 120 and what he was doing. Now, I got the definition of context up there, which is the circumstances that form a setting for an event. How many think the Father was setting this whole thing up? Because Jesus said, listen, I want you to tarry. I want you to wait in Jerusalem because you're going to receive the promise of my Father. Everybody say, my Father. Because okay? that's the same prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, what? Hallowed be thy name. So if you say the sinner's prayer, our Father who art in heaven... What is wrong with wanting to receive the promise of the Father? Okay? The promise of the Father. Turn to the person next to say, the promise of the Father. And, and, and what was God trying to accomplish on the day of Pentecost? Was He trying to make it martial? Was He trying to make it mystical? Was He trying to make it abstract? You know, all, all, all this stuff that, 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 that kind of gets, you know, for some people, spooky. Like somehow... The Holy Spirit's like Casper, the friendly ghost. You know, uh, I mean, it, it, it's crazy. But as we begin to look at this, as we begin to understand, we all know Hebrews 12, 29, which says this. Our God is a consuming fire. How many believe the Word of God? Raise your hand if you believe the Word of God. So it says, our God is a consuming fire. So let me pose you to this question. Why in the world would it surprise us that God wants to bring His promise in the sign of fire when He is the all-consuming fire? Right? So, so the nature of God, whether, 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 excuse me, I got too much air, whether we like it or not, is fire. Amen? That's the part that we're going like, well, you know, I love God, but I don't want the fire. Well, the nature of God, He's an all-consuming fire. Sorry. Actually, I'm not sorry. It's not just for the ADD people, like myself. It's for Nancy. Come on, say it. It's for Nancy. It's for the quiet ones. It's for the loud ones. It's fire. It's fire. Many denominations have run from this. And I asked the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, help me to teach this in the way not to take away from your word that people would experience your word, but also help them to understand that this is not abstract, this is not mystical, this is not something that they have to be afraid of, it's not strange. And I believe that He helped me, I believe that you will uh, uh, grab something from this today, but on the day of Pentecost, they would receive, they would receive the promise of the Father. They would be filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit came with the demonstration of wind and fire. Amen? It just, not, it, it just was not for the day of Pentecost. It is for today. Because is there anybody in this room 
that you might want to think that America today, or my family, whatever, could use a little wind and a little fire. Is there anybody here? Do we have a witness? Okay, if someone's asleep, just put your hand in their, fa in their face. Hey, you need some wind and you need some fire. There was a person in the, in the foyer who said, I could use a little fire under my you-know-what. The Holy Spirit led me. I, I have never preached on the Holy Spirit coming from the book of Leviticus. I'll be honest with you. Leviticus to me reads like a phone book at times. There's a lot of words you can't pronounce. There's a lot of rules, a lot of regulations. They're all good. I, 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 I love the book, but I never came from it. But in Leviticus chapters 1 through 5, very interesting. How many have ever read the book of Leviticus? Okay, you need to read it again especially chapters 1 through 5, okay, because what you're going to find in those chapters is the five different offerings that God sets up for requirement for the children of Israel to worship Him. Right? And they are very extensive, um, but I would challenge you today uh, to get in there uh, and to read those five chapters. Now, chapter 6, to me, is the, is the best chapter out of... Uh, out of the first, well, it wouldn't be the best out of the first five because chapter six is chapter six. So, uh, But I want you to notice how God starts this and where God speaks to Moses. God gives all of these things to Moses. Okay, how many like to have been Moses about right now? Okay. Well, Leviticus chapter one, how many think verse one might be a good place to start? But in verse 1 it says, Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting. In other words, the tabernacle, uh, they call it the tabernacle of the testimony, okay, but the tabernacle of meeting, uh, this is where uh, they set up to meet with God. But uh, So what is interesting about this tabernacle, by the way, which God spoke from? God spoke to Moses from this tabernacle. Okay, we're going to show that in a little bit. And uh, the other question is what hovered above the tabernacle of meeting? This is why uh, the people who say we don't need the Old Testament anymore are silly. Uh, uh, we need the Old Testament. And we need the New Testament. And Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament, right? We, we, we can't go into that. But, but, but what hovered above the tabernacle of meeting? Okay, I think this is very important to understand. Now in Numbers 15, Numbers 9, excuse me, verse 15 says, Now on the day that the tabernacle was raised up. So there was a day that the tabernacle was first raised up. So on that day, when the tabernacle was raised up, this tabernacle that God spoke to Moses from, the tent of the testimony, from the evening until morning, it was above the tabernacle, like the appearance of fire. And this led them by day, and of course the pillar of fire by night, this is how they were led. They would stay weeks in the same place, or perhaps months, and then when, when, when the fire moved, when the cloud moved, that's when they moved. Amen? Right, so we see all of this symbolism kind of coming to life through the life of Jesus. Okay? Everybody say, the appearance like fire. Okay, now if you grew up in a Pentecostal church such as I, you would have heard the term, man, that guy's on fire. How many remember this term if you grew up in Pentecost? That guy was on fire. Okay, and I remember as a kid uh, how I, you know, Brother Arnold was on fire. Sister Maxine Grimm, she was on fire. Sister Emerson caught, caught on fire and she would, she would be like, like dancing in front of the altar and just giving praise to the Lord and, and, and not making fun of her, but I thought, man, I said, God is so awesome because there was a young child that was asleep. They used to have kids that slept at the like at the altar at our church, and and this kid came up and was kind of sleeping there, and, and Sister Emerson uh, caught on fire and she'd start dancing. I used to call her the old fire whistle. That probably wasn't right, but. But uh, she started dancing. She'd have her hands in there. And S Sister Emerson was probably like, you know, she wasn't light. Just put it that way. 
And uh, I'm going like, the kid's going to die. And she'd be dancing around that, and she'd miss that kid like, and she wasn't even looking at him. And I remember as a young boy going like, man, how did that happen? But what I want to do today, I, I, not me, but what the Holy Spirit wants to do today is, what does it really mean, Richard, that when we say, man, you're on fire? Is it just an emotion? Is it just a sense? Is it just something where you do something like strange and abstract and weird and, and everyone's scared of you now? Okay? I literally, when I go to pastor's meetings, there are pastors that are little, literally afraid of me. Uh, you know, because it's like, it's that, it's that spooky Pentecostal thing. Okay? But turn to the person next to you and say, you want to be on fire? You want the community to know you as a person on fire? And, and, and again, there is emotion attached to this. I get that. There is some, some, some things that do happen that sometimes we can't explain. But what does God want to do and to accomplish with a pastor who, who, who is on fire? And I'm not saying that I'm on fire. I need, I prayed this morning, God, I need to be on fire. I need to be on fire for my congregation, for my wife, for, for my son. My son needs to see a dad on fire. Amen? So like the appearance of fire. So this fire indicated the presence of God and his leading. We understand that. And God, like we said, he is this all-consuming fire. Therefore, if God is the all-consuming fire, all fire must start from him. Turn the person next say, you can't start a fire. You can't start a fire. Come on, point at Pastor Barry. You can't start a fire. I'll give you permission to point at me. You can't start a fire. The symbols of God can't start a fire. Charismatics can't start a fire. God starts the fire. Okay, I, and I'm going to show you scripturally. And the problem that is happening is we have fake fire. We have false fire. We have strange fire. Fire that was, was well, that person's on fire when in all actuality they were not on fire. And I'll show you from Scripture. And we're just going to stay with that. How many think it might be good to just stay with the Bible? So uh, going back to Leviticus, now, now God has given all of these commands for the priest to, 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 to do if they are to offer these sacrifices, that would be pleasing to the Lord. So dads, I could have talked about this last week. Are you offering sacrifices to God that are pleasing to the Lord for your family, right? Because you're the priest of the home. We talked about that. But, but in the case of this priest, Leviticus 6, 12-13 says, The fire on the altar shall be kept burning. Say that with me. Shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out. In other words, they were not supposed to quench it. They were not supposed to smother it. They were not supposed to suppress it. Okay, They were just simply supposed to steward the fire. Amen? By the way, which, which we're not very good at today. Okay? The priest shall burn. I would say burn. The priest shall burn wood on it every morning. So it, so it, so it needed fuel so the priests were going to, to, to manage it. They, they were supposed to put wood on the fire, and they were going to do it every what? Morning. And they lay burnt offering in order on it, and he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offering, because the fire is there, and the fire shall always be burning on the altar. You notice that God's trying to, what is God trying to get across? Don't let this fire burn out. Because he says it again, the fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. Ever. God says, I don't want this fire ever to go out. Why? Because I'm an all-consuming fire. I do not want it to go out. So, 
The question is, who started the fire? We said, well, God started the fire, but how do we know that? Well, we stay in Leviticus. We go to verse uh, chapter 9. Now, all of these offerings, no fire has happened yet. That He's just given the order and the, the, the setup. Uh, a lot of people think that the priest started the fire. The priest did not start the fire because Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people, blessed them, and came down from uh, offering the sin offering, and uh, the burned burnt offering and the peace offerings. That's three of the five. And Moses and Aaron went, where did they go? Kathy, where did they go? They go into the tabernacle by the way, which has a cloud by day and a pillar of fire as a fire by night. You find this interesting? So they go into the tabernacle of meeting, and then they come out, and they bless the people. The Bible says, then the glory of the Lord appeared to all people. And I began to think about this. Jeremy, we're going to pray for this for you when you go to the mission field, that we would be filled with fire, that this place would have hovering over it the Spirit of God, that the Spirit of God would dwell in this place so that when, when, when we come out of this, quote, quote, tabernacle of meeting, that the Lord would appear in our community, that this community might be blessed. Amen? That was pretty weak. Want to try that again? Amen? Some of you are going like, what do I have to do? He's setting us up, honey. Careful. No, actually, God wants to set us up. Now, I want you to notice verse 24. Verse 24 is very powerful for me because in verse 24 it says, and the fire came out from before the Lord. Say it. And the fire came out before the Lord. There was no fire yet. They had set all this stuff up. They had it all ready, but there was no fire yet. The priest didn't start this fire. They were only to keep wood on it and to keep it burning. Okay? So so when all okay, so the fire came out. Everybody say came out. The fire came out from before the Lord. Why? Because he is an all-consuming fire. Now let me ask you a question. Why would this change just because we're in 2023? In case the person next to you doesn't know this, just tell them, newsflash, God's still an all-consuming fire. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. He's still an all-consuming fire. So the same fire that came out from before the Lord is the same fire that can come out and and, and produce something in your family, in your life, in your church, and in your community. God is an all-consuming fire. Amen? As the phone rings. And the fat on the altar, when all the people saw it, they shouted, and then they fell on their face. Man, they shouted and they fell on their face. Now, why is this? I have no idea. The only thing I could come up with is because they didn't know what else to do. I mean, how many have ever had something happen in your life that's totally, totally totally awesome? You just don't know what to say. You just don't know what to do. You just have to lay prostrate before the Lord and say, God, thank you. When I'm at the altar day and I am pray, praying, I said, God, prepare me. Make me ready. He goes, Barry, you're you're never prepared enough. It's almost like he was saying, there's so many faults in you, man. But I called you, and he said these words, I send fire, I will send fire to imperfect people. I will send fire that don't even understand it. They won't even know why it happened. But I will send it because I am that all-consuming fire. And this fire will not destroy them. It will bring comfort to them. It will bring relief for them. They will not be able to control it, but it will bring warmth to their relationships. It will bring uh, uh, me into their life. Amen? So the priest didn't start the fire. Come on, say it. The priest didn't start the fire. But they were commanded to keep it going. They didn't start it, but they were commanded to keep it going. 
Isn't this interesting? God said, I'm going to start it, but I want you to steward it. Today we would use the word manage. I didn't use the word steward because people probably understand manage more than steward. Okay? So, so we're to manage it. We're, we're, we are to steward it. We are to keep it burning. You see this? This is what the church has failed to do, Dorothy. This is, we, we, we have failed to do this. We did not keep the fire burning. We did not manage it very well. So God on the day of Pentecost started a fire and He wanted the 120. Would you agree that all Scripture is by the inspiration of God? So if God did this in the Old Testament, why would God send some fire in the New Testament and just have it for one day uh, so, so these 3,000 people could have a witness of, uh, of who God is. No, on the day of Pentecost, God started a fire, and He's saying, I took oxygen off you so you could be a steward and keep it going in that nursing home. Come on, people. Put your hand in the air and just say, I'm a fire bug. Keep it burning. Holy fire, burn away my desire for anything. See, fire in the Old Testament then hovered over one place. The fire hovered over the tabernacle. Right? But now, on the day of Pentecost, what does God do? See, this is just not hovering over the, 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 the upper room. It is actually hovering over each person in the upper room. This is the first time that this ever happened. They were used to the fire of God. They were used to it hovering over one place. They had seen it all the time. Okay, but not this. Now, all the 120, everyone that was in that room, 120, each person had the fire hovering over them. So God's fire moved from a place to an individual. You see this? Okay. How many think this is good teaching? So they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and now the reason why they were filled with the Holy Spirit, not to do something strange or to have some antic take place. Yes, they did speak in tongue. We could go into that. Okay. We, we, we have before, but but... They were filled with the Holy Spirit because now their body would now be a temple of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, was going to abide in each person. Amen? They did not have to rely on just hovering over a pl one place, but now they could have the Holy Spirit with them. And in them, the Holy Spirit hovered over them. How do we know this? Well, people, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that your body is, everybody say is, the temple of the Holy Spirit? See, God was creating something new with wind, just like we talked about a couple weeks ago. Okay? He... he he was, he was bringing in His church. Amen? And now, He's saying, the temple of the Holy Spirit, by the way, who is in you, whom you have from God. You see this? And you are not your own. So you don't get to do with your body what you want to do, young lady. You wait till marriage. I know it's old-fashioned and I'm an old geezer. Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we glorify our God, I mean, we glorify our Father with our body because it's not my body. Oh, by the way, who do you think breathed in you? General Motors? General Motors didn't breathe in you, Hugh. God breathed in you. So He gets to do with your body 
what he wants to do. He wants to bring, but, but, but the word of God says that I want you to be in good health, that you would prosper. Our sister's going to come up today, and God's going to bring healing, I believe. Ladies are just be around her and just going to pray with her. Nothing weird's going to happen. The only thing weird's going to happen, we're going to have a little Holy Ghost huddle, and we're going to believe for our sister. I'm going to say, did I drop something? That was in stereo. Yeah. For you were bought at a price. What price is that? The blood of Christ. Why do you think you can do what you want to do when you want to do it when Jesus says, I bought you at the price? What is your problem? Oh, I can't forgive them. Or oh, I, I can't stand working with them. Hey, I get it. But who's your boss? Who purchased your body, Crystal? That, by the way, has been dealing with some things. That God knows, but He will bring victory for you. Because it's His body. If we'll just trust Him. And not suppress what God is trying to do. Through teaching. You will hear teaching today of suppression of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's okay to have a campfire in your church. <laughs> yeah. But don't you dare start an uncontrollable fire. God. Because we like to roast our wieners and our marshmallows. We all like to be comforted. And we all want to be comforted at our potluck today. And uh, pot blessing, whatever you want to call it. Dinner. If you were bought at that price, therefore, glorify God in your body. Amen? We are sacrificing our children just like the children of Israel sacrificed their children when God brought a warning against the children of Israel because of their sacrifice. We are mutilating children. We are aborting children. We are no different than the tribe of Israel. There's only been two nations that have been started by God. Israel and America. So do you think it's very interesting that they're trying to do this to our children? They're trying to shut down our churches. They're going to shut us down on YouTube because we're talking about fire and they don't want the fire. But the joke's on you because if God starts the fire, if God strikes the match, you can't blow it out. And that's what I'm waiting for. Matter of fact, at the end, I said, God strike the match. Come on, say it. God strike the match. See, the fire of God came in the person of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, by nature, is fire. So the Holy Spirit, not only by nature, is fire, He is a person. We got to talk about this because only a person, he's not some gassy cloud. May the force be with you. The Holy Spirit is a person because only a person can make intercession for you. And we all love the fact that Jesus is making intercession for us. How many love that? That Jesus is on the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us. But you know what? You know what, church? How about, having in it, how about having fellowship with the Holy Spirit? How about connecting with the wind and the fire? Because the Holy Spirit also makes intercession for you, but we seem to want to suppress that one. I just say seems. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 27, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us. Only a person could do that with groanings which cannot be uttered. I have been in these services. I've been with the old timers who groaned. And, I, and let, let me tell you, it was awesome. Sitting next to these people. Listening to them pray. And they would pray and then they'd, oh. Every time uh, Brother Davidson, remember that, Faye? Bro Brother Davidson was one of our teachers. And, and he would groan in the spirit many times. Now he who searches the heart knows the mind of the spirit. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to whose will? According to the will of God. 
See, the Holy Spirit's doing this because the Holy Spirit wants you to know the will of God. Why suppress and why run away from a person who wants to help you know God's will? How many think that's a good question? So how many think fire is useful? We have winter here. Fire is useful. <laughs> okay? Um, it produces light. It purifies. We're going to sing that song today. Purify my heart. Let me be as gold what? and precious silver. It can bring warmth and bring comfort, but it has to be in the right conditions. Amen? See, uh, and then, every, every say fire is dangerous. Now, when I put this down, mom taught me not to play with fire. That didn't know it, that wasn't always accomplished. My mom tried to teach me, don't play with fire. And there are many times, if you want to hear those stories, I'll tell them yet, potluck, okay, because we don't want to mess it up here today. But, but there are times where fire intrigued me, and I got in a little bit of trouble with fire. And I didn't listen to my mom's instructions. I found out <laughs> that it, it could possibly be very dangerous. Okay? What's so interesting about this is in chapter 9, we know all this happened. The fire came out from the presence of God. But, but, but now you've got the two sons of Aaron, and they are now priests, okay? Uh, uh, Nadab and, and Ab, Abihu, uh, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and they put what in it? They put fire in it. They put incense in it and offered profane fire. We say profane fire. They offered profane fire. Some of the translations say strange fire. But they offered this profane and strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. That's why that's kind of yellowed there. It, this was not commanded to do it this way. Okay? Now, so fire went out from where? Just... Just like in chapter 9, the fire went out from the Lord, the fire started, and now the, uh, uh, the priests are keeping the fire burning. Now from this fire that the Lord started, uh, Aaron's sons offer up some strange fire, and now fire goes out from the Lord, but instead of blessing them, it devours them. And they died before the Lord. Now, Americans are not going to understand this because we think everyone has rights. Uh, guess what? We don't live under the Constitution. We live under the Word of God. We, 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 we are part of a kingdom. And a king is not voted in. Okay? God does not hold a business meeting. And all in favor of me killing Aaron's two sons say, I... No, he didn't have to because he's, because he's a judge. And that judgment is to bring us closer to God, not away from Him. And here's what's happening. This is why we need fire. This is why this message to me is very important for me. Okay? It's because America was attacked on 9-11 just like Israel was attacked. God tried to get our attention. And for just a brief moment, people came back to church and then they left God, and we have been running so far from God now that we have women, uh, men and women sports. We have, you know, tra transgender stuff going on. We have homosexuality peaking. Okay, we got all this stuff going on. We have young boys that are being told that they are girls, and young girls tell them they are boys. They don't even have the permission of the parents in some of these states. We have come so far from God, but yet it doesn't seem like it alarms pastors. Or the church in America. Now that's just my opinion. You can have a different one. But I, I'm telling you pe people. I haven't heard this. I'm not a prophet. I'm a preacher. If I tried to prophesy to you. That, that's not what I do. Okay I'll leave that to those people. But I can tell you this. I can tell you by scripture. That if America doesn't turn around. We're going to have fire one way or another. And you might as well have the fire for your family right now in a comforting, warm way instead of a destructive way at the end which says, Mom and Dad, why did you not teach me about this coming judgment of the Lord? 
Judgment is coming upon America. I know you don't like to hear that, but unless we turn, unless we repent, unless we have a contrite heart, which is a, which is a heart of repentance, the fire will come, the very fire that the church in America has been suppressing for the last 25 years because they were not comfortable with God's fire. We can't start the fire. But we are commanded to keep it burning when God starts it. Am I saying that God started a fire here? Absolutely not. If this was God's fire, then this message is in vain. I don't know what that really looks like. I can turn it to some scriptures. But I can tell you this, God starts the fire. We need to pray, God start the fire in my family. God start the fire in my church. God start the fire at, at Walmart. God start the fire at the donut shop. In between donuts, people getting filled with the Spirit. Not a bad idea. Instead of cream filling, it's Holy Spirit filling. Come on, people, what's wrong with that? And then just for it, just give them some extra cream filling. The Word of God admonishes us to manage the fire. So the question then is, how in the world do you do that? How do you manage the fire of God? Boy, and I was going all sorts of different directions, so I just thought, I'm just going to give you what the Holy Spirit gave me, Teresa. How's that sound? Here it is. Just submit to it. Just submit to it. He's the all-consuming fire. Submit to it. Can I hear an amen? To submit is to become obedient to the Holy Spirit's leading and prompting. Yes, he still does that. So I am either submitting or I am suppressing. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care what name's on the sign. I don't care what kind of experiences you've had in your life. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. I spoke in tongues in 1965. And, and, and that's good. Father, do I say this? I'm an Assembly of God minister with a very contrite and repentant heart. My denomination, Toby, if you're listening to this, my denomination has suppressed the Holy Spirit to the point that we will no longer allow Him to come to our altars and fill people's lives because we got to somehow... Get all of this in 45 minutes. Because people won't take it for more than that. You know what? I, Jason, I have more faith in you than that. I've got a couple of them here. I have more faith in you young people than that. I believe that you're sick of what's been going on. Where you come to church and and for the most part, playing games, thinking that we have submitted to the Holy Spirit, when all actuality has been a suppressing of the Holy Spirit because, because, well, I'll do that when I get home. And we never do. By the way, suppressing is just a, a fancy word for quenching. What does the Bible say? First Thessalonians 5.19 Do not Quench the Spirit. Does that sound like anything, Jerry, that was in the book of Leviticus which says, don't let the fire go out. In other words, high priest, don't you dare quench this fire. We have young people here. I want, I, yeah, she waves at me. Hello. Don't you, don't we want young people to be filled with the Spirit? Really? 
filled with the Spirit? Don't we need older people truly filled with the Spirit? Don't we really want to say, hey, what happened in church last week? Man, I was set on fire. And they're going to go, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to explain it here in just a little bit. Or shall, shall I say the Spirit will explain this. See, I quench the Spirit when I choose not to obey. It's that simple. The Word of God says, read my Word. Jesus said, keep my commandments. The Bible says to be in the house of God. The Bible says to love one another. The Bible says to honor one another. The Bible says to go into all the world, right, Marshall, and preach the gospel to every creature. That we're supposed to go to the highways and the byways and reach them. What's the highways and byways in McCook? Anybody around us? Quenching the Holy Spirit is what has stopped us from being a light in the world. The church, in a sense, has lost its light because the church in America has suppressed the Spirit to the point that the light, in other words, how many have ever said this term? Man, I'm just burned out. I love that. That's me, man, Pastor. You hit it right on the head. But spiritually speaking, Jeremy, is God going to send you to Spain so you can burn out? God going to send you to Spain, all of a sudden you lose the fire, you come back? God going to send you to that jail that you go to and say, man, I'm just so burned out. No, do, can I ask you a question? I got on the screen coming up, but how we think God doesn't burn out. God's an all-consuming fire. Let me explain this. Because I had to, how many think that God can explain this better than me? Okay, because I am not saying that you are a sinner if you feel burnout. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying, spiritually speaking when we forget and just say, God, I'm done. I'll just wait till you come back. But when you look at Moses, everybody say Moses. Moses, how many of you think Moses had a call of God? Would, would, would you agree with that? I mean, if you don't, read your Bible again. Can I ask a question? How did this call start? Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared before him in a flame of fire. Do you find it interesting that on the day of Pentecost that God begins to appear before his people once again in a flame of fire and begins to call his church to be a witness to Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth? Everybody go like, wow, that's so true. From the midst of the bush, so I looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire. But the bush was not consumed. You know the story. So guess what? Young people, your calling will start with God's fire. Not Pastor Barry's fire. Not with worship or any of that. No, it's going to start with the fire of God. Why? Because God is an all-consuming fire. You want to know why? In a sense, why people keep messing up? Because, in my opinion, Richard, they just need the fire. You're still going to mess up, but now i got the fire. See, our call will start with the fire of God, and it will only be fulfilled by 
the fire of God. And you might be thinking, Pastor, that's pretty bold to say such a thing. I just gave you proof through Moses. What else do you want? You probably want one more. How is it fulfilled by fire? How many of you know the story of Jeremiah? Anybody here want to follow in Jeremiah's footsteps? If any of you raise your hand, you are a lunatic. This guy, Kelly, this guy went through a lot of stuff. Would you agree that we, quite frankly, you know, no, God, that's fine. Don't have time. But here's what Jeremiah said. He said this. Then I said, I will not make mention of him. I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to wait till Jesus comes. Nor speak any more in his name. But his words in my heart, like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it, and I could not. In other words, it was the fire that was shut up inside him that kept him going even when he felt like he was a loser. Just like us. You had this conversation with God just yesterday. I know you did because I did. Didn't you? God, I'm done. I'm done with all this. It, it, it's you know, I'll just wait till you come. It's over. No. But if there's this burning fire that's shut up in your bones, you will become weary trying to hold it in. And you cannot. You can only speak of Christ and His mercy and His love and His goodness. This is what's going to get you to Spain. This is what's going to keep you in Spain. And you take this verse with you and say, Dear least, we need the fire shut up in our bones. Matter of fact, it wouldn't be a bad thing to pray for you when you come up. Hey, man. Man, I messed up last week. That's okay. Why don't you come into the presence of God, however He wants to do it, and let the fire get shut up in your bones. Come on. Shut up in your bones. Got to be a song somewhere there. So we all need the fire of God shut up in our bones to get us through when nothing seems to be going right. So a person on fire, when they say, man, brother, you're on fire. You know what that means? You've just surrendered to the Holy Spirit. You may have done, you may have done nothing weird. <laughs> Quote, weird. You may have not had any antics happen to you. All you know is that there's this power and there's this authority that you 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 never had before, and the same words which you spoke a month ago, now you speak now, and they're powerful. Why? Because I'm on fire. I'm on fire. See, to quench the Holy Spirit is to suppress Him. Hey, worship team, can you come, kind of get ready? We're, we're going to sing an old hymn to start this thing off with. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice. How many, how remember that, whole, that, that old hymn? We wanted to start with this because this needs to be our prayer. So I ask you this question as we're coming up. Are you really His Am I really His? By the way, for some of you people that don't know, I actually get paid for doing this. It's not a whole lot, but I do get paid. That's how we've set this up in America. But I'll tell you this, and I promise you this through the power of the Spirit, that when you can't pay me, and if God's still calling me here, you won't have to because the fire of God's going to fall and it'll be shut up in our bones, okay? And this church is going to keep going. It's still going to have a pastor because we don't rely on, on, on money. We don't rely on outward things. We rely on His Spirit. We rely upon Christ, His Father, the promise of the Father. We're going to rely on Him. We're not going to suppress Him. 
because we don't want to have burnout. Suppressing the fire of God will only lead to burnout. Can I just spend some time with this? I know I brought you guys up already. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just not going to go to church today. I'm just so burned out. That's the same guy. That's the same guy just going, you know what? I'm not going to go to the bar tonight because I'm so burned out. I'm not going to drink booze anymore, Richard. I'm so burned out. I'm not going to watch TV anymore because I'm so burned out. I'm not going to go fishing anymore because I'm so burned out. The Bible says, give God one-seventh, one-seventh of our week. One-seventh. And we can't give it to Him because we're so burned out. Everybody go like this. It doesn't make any sense. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. We have got to stop. I have got to stop loving the world. I've got to stop suppressing the Spirit of God and the fire of God. It will only lead to burnout. You know how many pastors quit the ministry last year alone? I'll let you know later. One in every three churches can't even find a pastor. There's not enough pastors. They're, quit They're quitting. They're burned out. Because the last time I checked, God is a consuming fire, sir. And the God you serve never burns out. Say they did not start what God was doing in the book of Acts. But in my opinion, as you read the book of Acts, I think they did manage it pretty well. <laughs> they were on fire. So if you would agree with me today in this way, hey Jason, you, would you come and take this and put this over by the piano please? This is my prayer this morning, Kathy. God strike the match. I can't, you can't, maybe today, maybe not today, I don't know. But you know what? I want to come with a heart of worship today as I try to help lead these songs. As we come together in worship and we pray, God, strike the match. Start a fire. And if you do, God, help us to keep it burning. And let's never ever let it go out. That's a whole, there, there could be a whole other message to this, I get it. But it's real simple. God start the fire and you want us to manage it. Now that's up to God. Some of you are going like, oh boy, I should have skipped this one. What's God going to do? I, I don't know. All I know is just like in the book of Acts, God dealt with individuals. And I think that's what He's going to do again because that's what He's interested in. See, we've always wanted the fire of God to hover over a place in, the, in a sense. No, nothing wrong with that, right? Oh, Lord, let the fire just now. Right? But what about you as an individual? And we're kind of all in different places when it comes to this. Don't think it to be strange or abstract. Just believe and say, Father, start a fire in me. 
Start a fire in me. And then, Holy Spirit, teach me how to manage it so it never, ever burns out. Amen? I'm fully convinced that in my denomination, we've allowed campfires because they're comfortable. Right? How many love campfires? I love a good campfire. And then we come out with the smell of the campfire. How many know what the campfire smell smells like? But I would like to have a fire in a sense, not a sense, I'd like to have a fire that God starts because that fire is not controllable. But it, but it brings comfort and it brings warmth and it will not be dangerous because God's saying, I'm going to show you how to manage the fire. I'm going to show you how to steward your fire. And you're going to listen to my voice. Everything's going to be fine. Father, I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, that there would be a fire that would start in individuals. And Father, get out of our minds this whole abstract, mystical thing. And Father, because Holy Spirit, You are a person. But by the very nature of Your Spirit, You are fire. So I'm asking You, Lord, just to begin the process, just like You did in the book of Leviticus chapter 1. And then, Lord, consume us with Your fire. Consume us with Your fire, O oh God. Consume us. Can we stand?